That's the Reformed view. And the Reformed partaking of the Holy Supper. And this will help us, I trust, Lord willing, when we partake of the body and blood of Christ, Lord willing, in a month's time. So, the Lord's Supper, a full meal. First, what this does not mean, where we critique the house church view, which is spreading, getting more popular. And second, what this does mean. And with this, as with all other things, the error sets off the truth more clearly, helps you to understand it and appreciate it, and draws out things from the scriptures and the confessions that otherwise you would miss. Let me set forth then, at the beginning, the house church view of the full meal. This is the beginning of a major house church advocate, a man by the name of Atkerson. I mention that so that you know I'm not picking on some guy that's way off on the extremes or some minor figure, but this is, this is a big hitter in their views. Now listen to this, this is interesting. In the Lord's Supper, they hold, quote, the meal is pot luck, or as we joking would say, pot problems. Everyone brings food to share with everyone else. When the weather is nice, all the food is placed on a long folding table outside. A chest full of ice sits beside the drink table. Kids run wildly around. They are having so much fun that they must be rounded up by parents and encouraged to eat. After a prayer of thanksgiving is offered, people line up, talking and laughing as they load their plates with food. In the middle of all the food sits a single loaf of bread next to a large container of the fruit of the vine. Each believer partakes of the bread and juice slash wine while going through the serving line. The smaller kids are encouraged to occupy one of the few places at a table to eat. They sure can be messy. Chairs for adults, there are not enough for everyone, are clustered in circles, mainly occupied by the women who eat while discussing homeschooling, child training, sewing, and so forth. Most of the men stand to eat, balancing their plates on top of their cups, grouped into small clusters and solving the world's problems, and so on. The atmosphere is not unlike that of a wedding banquet. It is a great time of fellowship, encouragement, and so on. The reason for the event, in case you did not recognize it, and thought it was a barbecue or something like that, this is the Lord's Supper, New Testament style. That's their view. Near the end of that same article, the author concludes the fellowship and encouragement that each member enjoys in such a gathering is tremendous. It is the Christian equivalent of the neighborhood pub. It is the true happy meal or happy hour. <coughs> That's the full meal version of the house church people. Another house church advocate calls it a happy conversational meal. Now the key to understand this spreading and false view of the Lord's Supper held by house churchism, the key to understanding it is the first word in the name of this novel movement. House. House churches. And so the venue for the Lord's Supper in their situation and view is a house. Buildings are wrong. Special church buildings are sinful. Church buildings are <coughs> pagan. That's their view. And if it's not in the house, it's in the garden, as the example just cited. If the weather's good enough. But guess whose garden? 
the garden of somebody's house. And if you ask in their view of the Lord's Supper, full meal style, what's the amount to be eaten? The answer is enough to fill your belly so that you have sufficient food physically. And the reason for that is that's the way it goes in your house. You have a meal, people eat till they're full or till they're somewhat less than full if they're trying to diet a little, but they eat a certain amount. That's why within their circles, when we don't eat a whole loaf or a salad or a meat pie, we're criticized for eating just a tiny little smidgen and drinking just a little bit because it's a full meal. And you don't eat those sorts of amounts in your own home, do you? Because the house model determines how the Lord's Supper must go. It's similar too with the type of food. <coughs> Whatever the people like to eat, that's what's eaten at the full meal of the house churchers. After all, in your house, I dare say your wife doesn't go shopping for all the food you don't like. She buys the food, so far as possible, that you do like. And then along with the various foods that the people there typically like and eat, there's also bread and wine or grape juice. What about the duration of the full supper house church style? It's lengthy. Lengthy. An hour or more. One website said three to four hours. Why? Why? Because this is what happens when you have people over to your house. You invite someone over to dinner. The meal typically takes a bit longer than usual. There's conversation. It's a very pleasurable time. Then the person stays round afterwards, maybe for an hour or two or three, because the model is the house. The next point is conversation. When the church, the house church, comes together to have the Lord's Supper, there is supposed to be a lot of conversation. Conversation among human beings, among the participants at the supper. All sorts of topics can be broached. It is, as I quoted earlier, a conversational meal. And you understand why? Because that's what happens, and that's what you want to happen, that's what you encourage to happen, when you have people over on an evening for a night of fellowship. Make a nice meal, <coughs> sit down, let's say, at the sofa afterwards, chat and you were chatting at the table, this is the model for the supper. The mood is important and they draw this out too in their writings. It's like <coughs> happy hour at the local pub. It's a time when people are to come together and laugh. It's a time of fun and the kids are running about and so on at their Lord's Supper and that's good and proper as they see it. Why? Because that's the sort of mood that you aim at and want when you have someone over for dinner. And if you were to ask the people in the house church movement, what is the primary purpose for your house church coming together? What's the goal? What's central in it? They would say, the Lord's Supper, which for them means the full meal Lord's Supper. Dessert and all, the full meal. It is not preaching. They're very, very explicit on that. It's not preaching. That's not the central thing in the worship of the church. Of course, they don't really believe in the historic Christian and the form view of preaching. They've got a sort of sharing 
But it's not even their view of sharing and fellowship that have contributed. It's not that. In fact, that same chap I've been quoting, Atkerson says, even if all a church does on a given Sunday is celebrate the Lord's Supper, full meal style, it has fulfilled one of its primary reasons for having a meeting that week. You don't even need the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the church. You just need, on a Sunday, to use our sorts of terminology, a nice barbecue, have everybody together, relax together. There's something nice about that, but that's not the church. That's not the Lord's Supper either. The idea, you see, why the full supper meal is central is because, you can almost see where I'm going, it's because it's a house church. When you have someone over to your house of an evening, and let's do more of this, it's a good thing, it's enjoyable for all of us, it's part of the communion of the saints. When you have someone over from the church, you do not, and don't do this either, and I have ministered either to this, you do not sit the person down at the meal table and then proceed to preach. You don't do that. That would be inappropriate. But what you do, though, as you say, central to our evening, is a meal. We're going to have a meal together. Come and share. It be a nice evening. That's the idea of having people over. And all of these things, the full meal of house churchism, it's, it's let's make church in general and let's make the Lord's Supper specifically, because that's our topic this evening, like home. Like home. Let's analyze and critique this view. If we ask who administers the Lord's Supper, that's a very good question. Who administers the Lord's Supper? And the answer is anybody who's there. Anybody who's there. If she was there, she can pass part of the full meal salad over to Harry. If Bob's there, he can pass over the bread to Susan. If Jimmy's there, he can pass over the wine or grape juice to somebody else. Or he can serve himself the wine or the bread. And you all understand why that is. Because this is how it goes when a meet and you have somebody over or, or a barbecue outside. You know, this one passes this to so on. You go up to the table, you serve yourself, you take a burger. <coughs> That's the way. The house church shapes who administers the Lord's Supper? Now, the biblical and reformed view to the free wheeling spirits of the house churches is said to be, and they're not behind the door either, hierarchical, lording, lording. Because in the biblical and reformed position, and indeed the Christian church for 2,000 years, the Lord's Supper has been always administered by the minister. The Lord's Supper is administered by the minister, not because he wants to be up there at the front with people looking at him or something like that. That's the impression they give throughout all the writings. And they do that because they don't like the biblical view of office. That's what's being attacked here. The minister administers the Lord's Supper and baptism because sacraments, the two Christian sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, are signs and seals subservient to the word. Baptism and Lord's Supper signify and point towards and seal the self-same truth and none other that is taught in the preaching and application of the word. And so it was that the Lord Jesus, before he ascended into heaven in his great commission, said to the twelve disciples, minus one, Go ye out into all the world and preach the gospel, their office bearers, the apostles, and then it adds, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Preach 
in a subsidiary and serving that, you baptize. And the other Christian sacrament, that of the Lord's Supper, is also administered by the office of the minister. Let me show this to you from our Reformed Creeds. If you turn back a page, answer 75 of the Heidelberg Catechism says, two lines up from the bottom, I receive the elements from the hands of the minister. And in our circles, the minister passes on to the elders. If you turn over to the form for the ordination of ministers, page 285, the form which is read at my installation of all the ministers of the Word, in the PRC. The thirdly, at the bottom of page 285 says, their office, this is what ministers do, this is their calling, their office is to administer the sacraments which the Lord has instituted as seals of his grace, as is evident from the command given by Christ to the apostles, and in them to all pastors, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, Matthew 28. Likewise, regard to the Lord's Supper, I all received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, and then he is all to speak by the institution of the Holy Son. We see this too when we use our form for the Lord's Supper. This is 272. The very bottom of page 272 we read, in breaking and distributing the bread, the minister shall say, the bread that we break is the communion of the body of Christ. And when he giveth the cup, he says, and then down a bit on page 273, after the communion, the minister shall say. Very different from house churches and where anybody near the ketchup passes the ketchup. In the reform system too, elders oversee the Lord's Supper. It's not a barbecue where everybody's running around having games and relaxing, which is lawful in its own place, so good, enjoy it. The elders oversee the Lord's Supper. And this is intrinsic in the idea of elder. One of the two main New Testament words for elder, a word often meant in the Bible, authorized version of bishop means literally an overseer. So an elder is an overseer. And he doesn't oversee the civil government. He doesn't oversee the behavior in the local park inside his house. He oversees the church. And to oversee the church means you oversee the members who are the church. You oversee the minister. You oversee the preaching. You oversee discipline. You oversee order, and you oversee sacraments. That's part of what they oversee. And that includes the Lord's Supper. And the reason for this is not that there are certain people in a Reformed Church who want to lord it over others, or to exercise hierarchy, never mind tyranny. The reason for this is that Jesus Christ rules His Church. And he tells us in his word how he wishes his church to be governed. That is, he governs through the word, which word, speech, self, office bearers. And the office bearers have specific duties, what belongs to them, and then obviously things that don't belong to them, not their concern, that's not their job to do. Then the office bearers are the representatives of Jesus Christ who are called and ordained to serve his church in their offices. And the office of elder oversees and oversees the Lord's Supper. The office of minister, because he preaches the word, oversees the sacraments which signify and seal the message which he brings from the scriptures. And the general point of all this is that the church is the church. You say it's a tautology. Of course it is, but it's a tautology that some don't grasp. The church is the church, and the church has its own ways, its own government, its own rules, which are set forth in the scripture as a particular institution 
appointed and governed by Jesus Christ. And then the family and the home is the family and the home. The family and the home isn't the church. The church isn't the family. There are relations between them. There are some similarities. People in their families and homes are members of the church. The church is here to help you in your family and in your home. But the family is different from the church. And the family at home has rules and ways and guidelines and procedures different, peculiar, distinctive to itself. And we all know that. And that's the way we live. You don't come into the church and think that this church is governed exactly the same way your family is. It's not. And the church doesn't come into your home and rule your home the way the church is governed and start administering baptism, let's say, in your front living room because there's different rules and functions. That is, there are different spheres. There's the family, there's the church, there's also the state. There's also the individual who's governed by principles peculiar to what Scripture says regarding the individual who is to live in a family. There are rules for him there and he's to live in the church. There are rules for him there and he's to live in the state. There are rules for him there and there's certain different rules in the sphere of employment too. But there are spheres. And house churchism confuses, mixes them up and in the same way it therefore damages the family and it damages the church. It mixes things that God has distinct and that's summed up in its very name. The name that it gives to itself. House Church. The church is one thing and the house is another. Now, let's ask this too about the Lord's Supper. And remember, these negatives help us understand more clearly the same position. Who eats the full meal and the Lord's Supper according to house churchism? And again, we need to be very careful. The first answer to that question addressed to the house churches it would be, well, the people in the house church, the people in the house, I didn't say members, because house churches that reckons that a membership list and people knowing who are members and not, that's wrong, that might make people feel bad, though how the elders would know who are to be shepherded by them, who are under them, how do you know who's going to be excommunicated or be admitted after excommunication or whatever. Membership lists, pagan. That's what I So the people in the house church. Then what about this? What if an unbeliever is present? What if an unbeliever is present? I quote Atkerson. Should unbelievers be allowed to partake of the Lord's Supper? He asks. He answers. The Lord's Supper as a sacred covenant meal has significance only to believers. To non-believers, it is merely food for the belly. It is implied from 1 Corinthians 14 that unbelievers will occasionally attend church meetings. Unbelievers get hungry just like believers do. So invite them to eat food, and not just the burgers and the salad and whatnot, but also the bread and the wine. Invite them to eat too. Love them to Jesus. The danger in taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner applies only to believers. And they cite 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 32. Weird exegesis there. Love them to Jesus. What about the children of believers? This is intriguing. Regarding the one cup and loaf in the Lord's Supper, if an unbelieving child desires to drink the grape juice just because he likes grape juice, that's fine. No, it's not. However, if the parents purposely give it to an unbelieving child as a religious act, then that might, might be a violation of what the Lord's Supper is all about. It would be closely akin to the concept of infant baptism. You see, they're Anabaptists. See the rationale? House churchism. 
Well, if you have a number of people over, including unbelievers at a big meal at your house, who eats the meal? Remember the meal? And they're including here also the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper. The meal is for everybody who's over there in the home. Then they eat too. And who eats at a meal? Do you exclude your children from your meals at your house? No, you don't. And so they're caught in the horns of a dilemma here because almost all the Anabaptists, all the house churches are Anabaptists and they hate infant baptism with a passion. But they've got a problem. If, the, if it's an open meal and the unbeliever can eat and they say he can, well, why not even the children of believers? But then they realize the children of believers can eat. That is, if we give them one Christian sacrament, why can't we give them the first Christian sacrament? Baptism. And so they struggle a little bit here. And I don't know at this point in case I don't get back to it. Young children should not partake of the Lord's Supper. No. Well, the Reformed faith, on the other hand, teaches that the Lord's Supper is for the members of the church. Those who have been baptized, because baptism symbolizes and seals the entry into Christian faith, and then the Lord's Supper symbolizes our continuance in it. They'll be baptized first, then they come to the Lord's table. And in connection with this, we should say, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 11, that the person who partakes of the Lord's Supper needs to be able to discern and recognize the Lord's body. That is, he needs to know that this bread and wine isn't just ordinary bread and wine. It's been consecrated and set apart as a sign and a seal of the broken body and shed blood of the Son of God incarnate. They need to understand the message of the cross. They need to understand their own sin so that Jesus died on the cross to wash away our sins by taking our place as a substitute. They need to understand that those partaking of the Lord's Supper God's grace that regenerates us, gives us faith and enables us to benefit from what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago. And they also need to understand that the Lord Jesus is spiritually present in the bread and wine. That we don't worship the bread and wine. That we don't eat him carnally with our teeth. We receive him by faith and through the Holy Spirit. So those who come to the Lord's table who are baptized, who are members of the church, who understand the Lord's body, are able to discern it in the light of the Christian religion, and who are under the oversight of elders who supervise the Lord's Supper. And we say too that the children of believers don't come to the Lord's table because they're not ready yet. They haven't been taught sufficiently, they haven't made a confession of their faith. Then, then they come to the Lord's table and they're welcome with the rest of the saints. And as to the question, what about unbelievers? Well, let's turn to question and answer 81 of the Heidelberg Catechism, a good summary of the biblical teaching. For whom, question 81 asks, for whom is the Lord's Supper instituted? Answer, for those who are truly sorrowful for their sins, and yet trust that these are forgiven them for the sake of Christ, and that their remaining infirmities are covered by his passion and death, who also earnestly desire to have their faith more and more strengthened, and their lives more holy. But hypocrites, and such as turn not to God with sincere hearts, eat and drink judgment to themselves. Question 82 goes on, are they also to be admitted to this supper, who by confession and life declare themselves unbelieving and ungodly? No, for by this the covenant of God would be profaned, and his wrath kindled against the whole congregation. Therefore it is the duty of the Christian church, according to the appointment of Christ and his apostles, to exclude such persons by the keys of the kingdom of heaven, till they show amendment of life. And here's the house churches, and they're saying, we're going to reform the Lord's Supper, we're going to make it really biblical. We're going to have unbelievers partaking of the bread and wine. That's okay. We're going to love them to Jesus. That's profaning the sacrament and bringing down the wrath of God upon your house church. Fools. 
fools, playing and goofing around with the Word of God. But they're not interested. They're not interested in the doctrines and theology of the Lord's Supper. They have little doctrine. They boast about that. They belittle the great doctrines and study and conflicts regarding this aspect of the Word of God. That's all hair study. We're not interested in that. We should be. It's biblical. Vital for the church. Profane spirit. And you know why they're not in it? Well, we're having people over as guests. It's a house church meeting. Who quibbles over small doctrinal points as they see it when you have guests over to eat and drink and enjoy their company? That isn't the purpose of having people over, just having a nice meal together. And that's it. There is the one bizarre doctrine I did notice. I seem to love to spin new stuff. You're familiar with that word of Christ and he says, this do in remembrance of me. Well, this guy that I've been quoting particularly today, he says that's not about, it's not about our remembering what Christ did on the cross, though he wouldn't deny we to do that. It's about our eating the bread and the wine and the full meal in order to get Christ to remember to return. I kid you not. In order, it's not about our remembering Christ on the cross that way. It's about our eating. And presumably then Christ looks down from heaven, sees us eating, and then, ah, I've got to remember to return. In fact, the guy kept using the word persuade. We partake of the Lord's Supper to remind Christ to return, and we are persuading him to come back. Churchers argue for this full meal, but they have various arguments. I'm not able to cover them with the time limitations tonight. The first thing they typically do is refer to the Passover. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 12, the Passover. And their point is that the Passover was a full meal. <coughs> Agreed. It was a full meal. It was what we would call a dinner. And Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in connection with the Passover. And that's true, he did. In Exodus 12, verses 3 through 11, we see the institution of the Passover. Now in the Passover, various types of food were eaten that are not eaten in the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper presented in 1 Corinthians 11 and for us today. Lamb. They ate lamb at the Lord's Supper. And it was a special type of lamb, a certain age and with no blemishes. The lamb had to be cooked a certain way, roasted, not boiled. And whatever you couldn't finish of that lamb, you had to burn it the next morning. You weren't allowed to have leftovers the next day. And then with the blood of that lamb, you had to put it on the doorposts and the lintel. But we don't have to do that in the Lord's Supper. Because there's no angel of death passing by in the same way as there was with the 10th plague in Egypt. Then there are bitter herbs that were eaten at the, at the Passover. And they're not part of the Lord's Supper either. You will remember too that there was a certain way that the Passover was to be eaten according to Exodus 12. You eat it with your belt on, with your shoes on, with a staff in your hand, and you eat it quickly, gobbled. Because Israel is hurrying out of Egypt. Then Israel was to observe seven days of unleavened bread. Those are things that aren't carried over in the Christian sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Jesus Christ, instituting the second sacrament, took bread from the Lord's Supper. 
one aspect of the food, not the lamb, not the bread, just one, the bread, and then he added wine, which was not instituted as such in connection with the Passover in Exodus 12. So he took one piece of food and then he, from the Passover and he brought in wine from outside, and it's just these two things, bread and wine, that are required in the Lord's Supper. That's what Christ instituted in the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There's a reason why we eat bread and wine, and why we don't bring in cereal or chocolate or soup or anything else. The reason why bread and wine, why just bread and wine, is that they too are the sacramental elements. That is, bread symbolizes, and bread broken to symbolizes the broken body of Jesus Christ and what happened on the cross. The wine symbolizes his blood, which was poured out for our sins on the tree. That's why. Just those two. You do those two things, those two elements, and you have all that God has required. That's the Lord's Supper. Now let's look together at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11. This remarkable passage which begins at verse 17. Paul says regarding the assembly of the saints here in Corinth, I have no praise for you. When you church come together, you don't benefit spiritually, you do yourselves harm. You come together for the not for the better, but for the worse. Wow. Here are saints needing the church, coming together in desperate need to be built up, and going to church does them harm. So they leave worse than they enter. Why? There are divisions among you. Disunity, schism, cliques. When you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. Now it's interesting, Paul in his letters deals with reports and expectations, and sometimes when he knows the person or the church, he says things like, I know you will do what you're required to do, and I know you will do above and beyond what I ask. Sometimes when he hears criticisms, he knows that's not true. No, don't accept it. Other times, when the Corinthians were a case in point, he said, yeah, that's not a very strong church. There's some foolish people there. Yeah, I can well believe it of them. He believes this too because he understands and knows that the Christian church, verse 19 teaches, will always have heresies. Now the word heresy isn't here a doctrinal error, it's schisms. And schism is an alienation of affection in the church where some don't love the others as they ought and form what in our society is called cliques. So I know that this is the case because you're a weak church. There are some that have caused problems. And also I know this is the case because there must always be this in the church because God has put it there for this purpose that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Then he goes on to say, when you come together into one place because of these divisions, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now the bread and the wine is there but it's impossible because of your sins to really partake of the Lord's Supper and to benefit. And so you come together not for the better, but for the worse. And in this church at this time, they were having a meal before the Lord's Supper. That's what verses 20 and following clearly imply. Some people were eating their meal before the others had arrived. Some people were having more food than others. Some people were taking more drink than was good for them, so that some ended up full, some ended up hungry, some were sober, and some were drunk. 
And here, the house churcher says, you see, you see, they had a full meal before their service. Mm. What's Paul's response? What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Why don't you eat at home? Why don't you eat at home? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Whereas they say that the church met in a house, and that the church should eat before it has the Lord's Supper a full meal. Here the church comes together, and Paul says, Go home and eat your dinner. Have you not houses to eat? People with no homes. What are you doing here? You have no homes. Now there are times when the church can eat together. That's what happens in our church, that happens in some PR churches, especially where the people are coming from a distance. They have a morning service, then they'll have a meal in the foyer, take it turns, then they have a meeting service. Have you not houses? Or do you despise the church of God getting on like this? And then he adds, you're shaming those who have not. Because not only do you do this before the meal, and there's all sorts of problems with that, but you're doing it badly. Because some of these people are poor and they don't have enough food, and you stuff your face, and he's sitting there hungry. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? It's interesting how Paul admonishes the congregations. He's very mild here, but he implies a lot more. I praise you not. And then he says, then he says, this is the Lord's Supper. This is what you should be listening to. This other stuff's unnecessary at best. I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. This is what I was told of the Lord's Supper. And this is what I taught you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he broke the bread, he gave it to the people and says, Take ye, do this in remembrance of me. He took wine, he poured forth the wine. And he says, This is my blood. The blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. That's the Lord's Supper. That's what I taught you. That's what you're supposed to do. Just that. It's interesting too that Paul makes significant sacramental actions. The breaking of bread. The pouring out of the wine. And we do that in our Lord's Supper because that's significant. That's part of what Jesus did. That's part of what Paul told us to do. But you'll remember the house church view you have a table, and there's bread sitting there, and there's wine, or grape juice, for them, some of the grape juice way, and you just take it. There's no mention of breaking the bread, but the breaking of the bread is significant. Christ made it so. They leave that out. The pouring of the wine is significant because it bespeaks the shedding of Christ's blood, but you just go and pour it yourself, and there you thought of it, according to the model that Atkinson proposed. And then the words of institution are important. That's why we say, take Eat, this is my body which is broken for you in the sacrament. And then we say regarding the cup, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Sacramental words, sacramental actions, because that's at the heart of the sacrament. The house churches put it all in the wrong place. They say the key thing is, we have a nice meal and everybody gets fed and we enjoy ourselves and we have conversation. There's a time and a place for that. And this is not the time nor the place. And then it goes on to say too that some people eat and drink damnation to themselves not discerning the Lord's body. But that guy is non-believers partaking of God. So it only means that believers eat condemnation themselves and non-believers eat it. That's all right. For this cause, God took it so seriously, some among you, even many among you, are weak and sickly and I've killed a few of them to chastise you. Now, I'm not saying that God does this today. They do. That was the apostolic age, but he certainly chastises today for sloppy, careless partaking of the Lord's Supper, which the house churchers institutionalize, <coughs> make mandatory, and then criticize everybody else. And they do criticize everybody else too. So then, in the two concluding verses, Paul says, You know, if you have to eat together, before the Lord for his problems with that per se, but at least wait for one another. Verse 33. Wherefore, my brother, when you come together, eat, tarry one for another. If you're going to do that, wait till the other people actually come. And then verse 34, he gets at the whole idea of a full meal, the way the house churches take it in, in general, per se, 
And if any man hunger, let him be at home. The place for satisfying physical hunger isn't in the church worship service. Let him be at home. home. But the whole idea of a full meal is that we tell it. So therefore you shouldn't do that. Eat at home. And then Paul says, the rest will I set in order when I come. Because the point of this church in Corinth is not that they were doing what Paul had said. Paul said, I told you, verse 23, what the Lord's Supper was. Now you've gone mad at this. They were adding stuff. Some were carrying over from some of the paganism in part two, no doubt. And in essence, and this is John Calvin's idea, when he deals with the house church error and his exposition of this passage that 500 years before the modern guys, he says the big problem here was that you were making the sacrament which is special and holy. You're making it common. You're making it common so that even unbelievers can come and take it. You're making it common you're mixing it with all this other food so that people are thinking about their conversations. You're supposed to be thinking about one thing. My body which is broken for you, the sacrifice of Christ, the blood which is shed for your sins. Think about that. And the house church people say, well, you need a lot of food for it to be a, a, a full meal. Well, what did Jesus say about water in John 13? Simon told him, Lord, don't wash my feet. Jesus said, if you don't allow me to wash my, your feet, you have no part of me. Lord, then wash me all over. Jesus said, but all I need to do is just wash your feet with a little bit of water and that suffices. It's the same thing too with baptism. Remember, the house churches, they're almost all Baptists and they're almost all immersionists. You need an awful lot of water. And you need an awful lot of food too. Not so. These people argue that we need simplicity. Simplicity. Go back to the New Testament model. Not a bit of it. Our sacraments are incredibly simple. All we need is water, not even a whole lot of it. Just a little bit of water. It can be done anywhere, anytime, very simple. What do we need when we have the Lord's Supper? Bread and wine, you can get those very easily. House churches, when it comes to sacrament, you need a tank, or your neighbor's swimming pool, or a river. Not easy, especially in cold climates. Whenever it comes to the Lord's Supper, you need you need the women, and any men are any use to that sort of thing, to make dinner for everybody. And most of them say, weekly. There's a lot of work for the catering company. Some of them say, if possible, daily. We're almost out of time, some could argue we are. But let's look quickly at Belgian Confession 29. Belgian Confession. Uh, 35 rather. Belgian Confession 35. We believe, it says in page 70, we believe and confess that our Saviour Jesus Christ did ordain and institute the sacrament of the Holy Supper to nourish and support those whom he hath already regenerated and incorporated into his family, which is his church, only for God's people. And then it goes on, the next paragraph, to say there's two sorts of life. Natural life, spiritual life. The two sorts of life are supported by two sorts of food. Natural life by physical food. Spiritual life by spiritual food, which is signified in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. And that's the problem of old house churchism. It takes the physical food and the spiritual food and mixes them together in an unhealthy way. But if we want to talk about the full meal, and I'm shortening this for you too, we should know that we do have the full meal. We have the full meal as the Heidelberg, as the Belgian Confession goes on to say, because this feast is a spiritual table, not a physical table, at which Christ communicates himself with all his benefits to us. That's a full spiritual meal. And he gives us there to enjoy both himself and the merits of his suffering and death. That's a full meal. Nourishing, strengthening, and comforting our poor, comfortless souls by the eating of his flesh and quickening and refreshing them by the drinking of his blood. And my flesh is meat and food indeed. And it's interesting too, at the top of page 73, we read, We receive this holy sacrament in the assembly of the people of God with humility 
and reverence. It's not a fun thing, as the world says, humility and reverence. And very practically, we should end with this. The number one argument, emotionally, that they have in their view of the Lord's Supper, and this is some from their own being that convinced them is very practical. We can all understand this. I don't get enough out of the Lord's Supper. The minister told me it's a great spiritual feast, but I feel a little benefit from it. I'm not excited, enthused, encouraged, and edified as I feel I should be by the Lord's Supper. Maybe there's something wrong. And isn't it a whole lot nicer and more pleasant to have a lot of people around at your house and have a big meal and have the kids riding around their bikes and everybody together telling jokes, enjoying themselves. That I can get more excited about than the difficult spiritual work of meditating on Christ and receiving the means of grace together. And if that's true of us, who can say it's not at times because we're weak? We need the full meal spiritually and we receive the full meal spiritually insofar as we're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. As we really want to eat and drink Christ and conceive of him as our life and our all. As we come sorrowing over our sins and wanting to grow in grace. And the more we do that, the more we will experience the riches of the Reformed faith as taught in our forms and as experienced and received in the Lord's Supper. Amen. Amen.